The great theologian and preacher C.H. Spurgeon wrote this about Psalm 103, and part of which will be our reading for today. As in the lofty Alps some peaks rise above the others, so among the inspired Psalms there are heights of song which overtop the rest. Now clearly we don't have time to read the whole of the psalm, but Patricia will now bring some of the verses to us. Psalm 103, beginning at verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. I think most of us will never forget the date, 23rd of March 2020, the day the UK was locked down as a protection against COVID-19. And many of us will have suffered, some greatly. The isolation, the loneliness, not being able to see our loved ones, and the very real fear of going outside the front door. But one of the blessings from this time has been the introduction of our online services from St Mary's. The church doors were firmly locked, but our corporate act of worship continued. And other churches have the same idea. And we are most grateful to David Kidney for sharing the Facebook page from one of them, St Magnus Cathedral Congregation. And every week, like us, they produce a short service online. So on a Sunday morning, as well as the St Mary service, we watch one from the Orkney Islands as well. And the inspiration for my sermon today comes from a beautiful segment of these services. I'd like to share it with you now. To be honest, those words and the beautiful music have been going through my head for months, especially in the last few weeks. This chant is from the Teze community in France, and whilst not exactly a perfect quote from Psalm 103, it is based on the opening verses that we heard, and it certainly sums up the central message. But before I get to that, I must just clear up the matter of the different verbs being used in the NIV and the authorised or King James versions of the Bible. In verse 1 of the NIV says, praise the Lord, and the NRV says, bless the Lord. As Christians, we're very familiar with both verbs. We sing praises to God, we praise him in our prayers, thanking him for our, his goodness and his love towards us. But what about blessing? And in particular, the idea of us blessing God. We're more used to it being the other way round, with him blessing us, aren't we? So is us blessing God the right word? You've guessed it, I checked out the Hebrew, and the word is baraki which comes from the verb barach, which means to kneel. By implication, it's an act of humility. Now, not convinced that I got the whole picture here, I decided to double check. What is the Hebrew for praise? The verb is halal, from which we get the familiar hallelujah, praise God. 
And I found it interesting that among the many meanings of halal, the Hebrew dictionary lists to make a show, to boast, and to be clamorously foolish. And doesn't that last one remind you of King David when he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem and there he was in the streets dancing and shaking his heads and his hands and his legs all over the place. He was praising God with every part of him. So, getting back to my original question, the verb in our verse 1 is definitely bless the Lord, not praise the Lord. I'm pretty sure we know how to praise God, but how do we bless him? And is there a difference? We bless God when we talk to him or we talk about him, recognising his divine nature and character. Now, some might argue that's the same thing as praising him, but I believe there's an important difference. The words we use might well be the same, but the context is different. Let me give you an illustration which might help. Supposing you were in a, a large crowd in London, as I was, awaiting the Queen. She was due to process in a state coach to a Thanksgiving service at St Paul's. And in 1972, I was there, taking a break from my office in Shell Centre on the South Bank. I crossed the river and found a spot on the front row near to Charing Cross Station. Dozens of police were lining the route and there was me dressed in my office suit and tie, surrounded by hundreds of tourists. I felt quite out of place. The police outriders swept past and then we could see in the distance the phalanxes of the household cavalry and what a sound as they trotted past and we were getting more and more excited. Then we could see the coach bearing Her Majesty coming towards us. The crowd went wild and I just couldn't help myself. I was shouting and waving just like everyone else. I actually saw the Queen. It was live. It was real. Not a recording on television. It was just so exciting. On the other hand, and I've never been in this position, suppose you were invited to the palace to attend an investiture or a garden party. When the Queen passes by, or you're actually introduced to her, you bow or you curtsy. In both circumstances, we'll be acknowledging who the Queen is, one with exuberance like praise, and the other more reverently, recognising our position. Which takes me back to the Hebrew for to bless, which is barach, from the root to kneel. From that position, mentally if not physically. We can then meditate or pray about God's character, acknowledging our humbleness. Is that a word? Our own insignificance compared to him. When God blesses us, we are always changed for the better. So when we bless God, he isn't changed, but extraordinarily we are. So what practical steps can we take to bless God rather than praise him? Over the years I've used a little exercise to help me remember God's characteristics. I take each letter of the alphabet in turn and use it as the initial letter of a word describing God. Let me try and explain. For the letter A we could think about God being almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful and meditating on each one. For the letter B, we could think of his beauty, that he is bountiful. C, creator, D, divine, E, eternal, everlasting. And when we do this sort of thing, we're actually blessing God. And amazingly, we've been blessed in the process. It does us good to think about such things. And I believe we need to do this, particularly when we're going through a bad patch, which I'm sure applies to some who are watching this today. Bless the Lord my soul and all that is within me, bless the Lord. Now this tells me we should bless the Lord with everything we've got. It isn't just a case of going through the alphabet and saying Amen. 
The second phrase from the Taze chant, when I referred to it earlier, is the central message of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord my soul, he rescued me from death. That surely comes from our verse 4. He, that is the Lord, redeems my life from the pit. The pit? That's the eternity without God that we call hell. I'm so reminded of the renowned American preacher from the early 1700s, Jonathan Edwards, speaking softly to his congregation. There were no histrionics like we can sometimes see today. He painted such a graphic picture of hell and the danger of sliding into it. The folk in the church were holding on to the pillars of the church, the building, to avoid slipping into oblivion. Of course, we're all going to die at some point, but the death of a Christian is different. It'll be the moment of our entry into the eternity of heaven. Yes, I know that through faith we are already in the kingdom of God, but upon our death it'll be the beginning of a new life that will go on forever. And it's all because of Jesus, his death on the cross and what he achieved through it. If Jesus had simply died of old age, we could have tried to follow his teaching. That wouldn't have fixed the gulf between us and God. But on the cross, Jesus actually really took our sins upon himself. He became stained, dirty, ugly, and his father turned his face away. Jesus cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as soon as he uttered the words, he knew the answer. And we know the answer too. God, the Almighty, who is pure and holy, cannot be in the presence of sin. Now here's a sobering thought from that beautiful modern song by Stuart Townend. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Jesus did all the work to set us free. And all we have to do is to believe it. We can't make ourselves sinless. We can't make ourselves holy. But Jesus can. And the psalm writer David foretold that in our verse 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him, that is, who believe in him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So thank God for that. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for your supreme sacrifice. You died that we might have life, both now and evermore. Today, even as we've looked ever so briefly at some of the verses from Psalm 103, I'm not surprised that Spurgeon described it as an Alp above the other Alps. And once again, the Old Testament points to our beloved Saviour Jesus, and to him be the glory, this day and always. Amen. Amen.